we're going to talk about invariant subspaces. Before I forget, I want to uh, tell you sort of the source of whatever vestiges of organization there are in my talk. Uh, they come from this book written by uh, Rajavi and Rosenthal, and uh, by the title Invariant Subspaces. Uh, we won't cover the whole book today. <laughs> and uh, some of the things that I'm going to tell you about you know, happen after the book. Uh, but basically, it's, it's a good place to read. Um, I should take this opportunity to apologize to June, who I uh, suspected of having borrowed my book when I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a copy in the library, which uh, also was uh, checked out. Okay, so <laughs> mostly, uh, what we're gonna, uh, mostly we're going to talk about almost all the things that we're going to talk about. H is going to be a Hilbert space. <coughs> So that means that um, it's equipped with an inner product. Let me show you how, you know, why I didn't deserve C's in English with an inner product. And, uh, okay, I should make something, okay, an inner product. And really one of the themes of what we're going to be talking about today, so already I've put something out, it's going to be a complex open space. And that's really going to make a lot of what we do work. Okay, so it's equipped with an, uh, with an inner product and the subordinate, isn't that nice? Okay, the subordinate norm. Okay, which makes it therefore a bonnet space in particular. And uh, we're going to assume that it's complete. I'm not going to assume, at least at the beginning, anything about the dimension of H. Well, I'm going to assume one thing about the dimension of H. Let's assume that it's bigger than one to avoid total triviality. Okay, so people don't study very much Hilbert spaces because, just like um, vector spaces are red and stuff, when, so there's a notion of dimension. There's actually two notions of dimension for Hilbert spaces and for Bonnet spaces in general, there's the what's called the Hamel notion of dimension, which means you try to find the, the biggest possible linearly independent set, where what it means for an infinite set to be linearly independent is that finite linear combination, finite subsets are linearly independent. But those are like gigantic and useless, so we don't use those. Well, mostly what we use is the um, orthogonal dimension or the Hilbert space dimension, which is we look for maximal um, orthonormal sets in H, and the cardinality of that set completely determines H up to unitary equivalents. So, you know, there's really not much point in studying Hilbert spaces since we sort of have by themselves, since we have models for all of them. So once you're in a situation like that where you sort of understand the underlying spaces, the next thing I'm not going to use this kind of language too often. You study is like the morphisms, right, on the space. Okay, so those are called uh, linear operators. So uh, what we're always mostly on, mostly going to talk about is T, which is going to be um, a linear operator. It's the only kind I'm going to talk about. Um, a lot of H. And what that means is that T respects all of the, almost all of the structures that H has. So T respects uh, addition and scalar multiplication. In other words, it's a vector space uh, transform linear transformation. Now, technically, uh, scalar multiplication. Um, technically, if we were really studying things that preserve all the structures that there are, uh, we, should, after all, Hilbert space is equipped with an inner product, but uh, and we are going to study to some extent such operators, but we'll study something much more general. Although we won't study like the most general linear transformations, just like studying Hamel bases is like a sort of a useless um, enterprise. Studying all linear transformations without any regard to uh, the underlying structure of H is, uh, you know, sort of a losing proposition. 
although we'll do it today one time. Uh, so what we're going to assume is sort of take a halfway approach is that we'll assume that T is um, bounded, or what's equivalent to that is continuous. So everybody know what it means for linear transformation to be bounded? Again, hopefully. All right, if not, don't uh, be afraid to stop me if I say anything you don't believe or don't know what it's about. Okay, so those are the uh, objects which we're, we're going to study there. Linear operators are H. The other kind of thing that we're going to study is subspaces. So uh, M contained in H is a subspace. You know, so we're going to study the ones in the category means that uh, M is uh, linear subspace, first of all, linear subspace. So that means stable under addition and scalar multiplication. And we're also going to assume that M is closed in the underlying topology. Closed in the norm topology. One of the things we're going to do as we go along here is sort of see why there's this plethora of topologies in analysis. Hopefully I'll give you uh, so closed topology. Okay, and here is sort of the basic definition. As we say, so we're in this situation, we have a bounded operator on an over space. So we say that T, that M is invariant under T. where we know that T will have an, uh, in, so the invariant subspace problem is whether every uh, Hilbert space operator has a non-trivial invariant subspace. So what are the trivial invariant subspaces? Now those would be like zero and H itself. So when we talk about finding invariant subspaces, we're going to be looking for non-trivial invariant subspaces. And uh, so there's one case, so if H is not separable, okay, well here's, here's a way to construct invariant subspaces. Just start with any vector x in the space, and then you can look at uh, the closed linear span of all the powers of T, uh, including from n equals 0 to infinity of t to the n, guess I should say it this way, t to the n x as to n equals 0 to infinity. All right, so that will uh, be invariant under, okay, a, maybe the talk is over. So we can, <laughs> this is going to be a subspace of h. It's closed because we made it closed. It's linear because, well, we made it linear. Uh, and uh, all right, so maybe the talk is over. There is an invariant subspace, right, for the operator T. You don't know what A is, though. Hmm? I assume A is H. Okay. Thank you. So that's always an invariant subspace, but of course it could conceivably happen that it's not trivial, except there's one case when we know that it won't happen, when we know that it'll be non trivial. So if H is not separable, this closed linear span still is always going to be a separable subspace of H. So this is going to be non-trivial if uh, the underlying Hilbert space is not separable, right? So from now on, uh, we will assume that our spaces are uh, separable. Well, one case when we, of course, know that they're, uh, so um, I'm not going to assume that H is not finite dimensional, even though all we're seeing in very quickly that every operator in a finite dimensional space does have um, in non-trivial invariant subspaces. And uh, the easiest way to see that is um, to look, so I'm going to write sometimes when 
When h is finite dimensional, I'll sometimes write cn to sort of tell you for that. And instead of writing, uh, this, yes, I didn't give you the notation, b of h is like all the bounded operators on the f. So for b of h, in this case, I just write mn and by n matrices. So that way you know I'm talking about um, the finite dimensional case. So here's first proposition, a very uh, easy you know, proposition is that uh, every, if H is finite dimensional, uh, then every operator on H uh, does have
And that basically comes from Louisville's theorem, I mean, a jacked up application of Louisville's theorem. So every operator always has a non empty spectrum. And the second thing about it is that um, the uh, spectrum is compact, in fact. I'm not going to use that too, too much today. And it's actually contained in a ball of radius norm of t, closed ball of radius norm of t about zero. So spectrum is always a nice compact set. It's contained in the um, open ball spine in a closed ball of that radius. Um, okay, I want to mention, so we're going to sort of use this to find um, invariant subspaces for a certain class of operators. So, you know, we can't talk about eigenspaces ne necessarily. So we for to be not so advanced in the audience, you just said there's an example with no eigenvalues, and then you over here you said the spectrum was not empty. Okay. Oh, well, you want me to tell you what the spectrum of this is? No, I want you to explain why those aren't contradictory. Okay. I think I do spectrum for different concepts. Yeah. Okay, but he wants an example. So let's say, suppose, let's just look at zero, right? Okay, it's a good question. It's your best. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at my T minus zero times the identity, it's just multiplication by X. Now, there's no vector that that's, it doesn't, this, the null space of that operator is zero. You can't multiply, if you multiply an L2 function by x and you get uh, the zero function, that function must be uh, equal to zero almost everywhere, which means as a member of L2 it's the same. Right? So zero is not an eigenvalue of this. However, zero is in the spectrum because, okay, you could talk about um, the, what would the inverse of multiplication by x be? It would be the multiplication by one over x. Well, okay, you might be worried that 1 over x doesn't exist at 0. That's not such a big deal, because everything are actually equivalence classes. But the bigger problem is that 1 over x is not bounded on the interval 0, 1. And so that's not a bound. Multiplication by 1 over x is not bound. Well, I'm going to say the spectrum of that is just 0, 1. Okay. Uh, listen, uh, you know, anybody wants to? <laughs> so, so that's not. <laughs> yeah, okay, as long as, you know, it's nice to have some examples here. A more general uh, example here, you can multiply by any bounded measurable function. Uh, you can multiply on L2 of 0, 1. And it turns out that the spectrum of that operator, of such an operator, is what's the essential range of the function. I guess you guys learned about essential range at 8100 or something. All right, now before I was so rudely interrupted, <laughs> uh, I want to show you something. So the next thing that I want to tell you about, you know, just uh, to sort of do, be able to get something here, is uh, there's a notion of functional calculus, which is very useful in operator theory. Okay, so I'm going to make the definition um, orally without a right. So functional calculus is a homomorphism actually from an algebra of functions to an algebra of something else. In our case it will be an algebra of operators, right? So the easiest functional calculus that we have for every operator is just, um, it uh, goes, it's defined on the polynomials, polynomial functions, let's say. Right, because we can apply a polynomial to any operator, and it's going to be a homomorphism, P times Q, or let's say F times G applied to the operator is just going to be F of the operator composed, times means composed, right, and bounded linear operators, and respects to addition and scalar multiplication and all that. So we always have that. Now we actually can do a little bit better here because of knowing that the spectrum is contained in, uh, well, so, so that's sort of the first example. Here's a little fancier example. Uh, suppose F let's say, is analytic uh, in a closed ball 
of, well, let's say in a neighborhood, well, let's, we can just say on the spectrum of T. All right, remember when you talk about a function being analytic on a closed set, you mean it's actually analytic on a neighborhood, an open set containing that. Well, then, oh, I want to do some, that's going to be a little bit of a punchline. Let me do this. Let's say, suppose, first of all, that it's analytic, let's say, um, on uh, the set of z's such that absolute z is less than or equal to the norm of t. I get this right somehow. All right, so, well, then we know that that function has a power series, right? And that power series converges, right? And that whole thing. And so we can just apply the function to the operator by looking at the power series. So we have f of z is equal to the sum of a and z to the n. And we just define f of t to just be the sum a and t to the n. And it's not too hard to show that it still has all the properties of functional calculus. I didn't say some of the obvious ones, like the constant function 1 should give you the identity operator. Um, and it's going to be multiplicative and additive and all that good stuff, OK? But now let me tell you a, uh, you know, sort of a more general one. We're actually going to have several more general ones, but this one will get us sort of our first invariant subspace. Result here is, um, so suppose only that f is analytic uh, on, or in a neighborhood, <coughs> of the spectrum of t. Well, that, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that f will have a power series expansion on the spectrum. The spectrum of t might look like, you know, something like this. And, we might have sort of, in fact, this is exactly what we're going to be thinking about. We may have our function sort of analytic, you know, in a little neighborhood of this and this, but there wouldn't be any ball that the function's analytic in. So we wouldn't necessarily have a power series. But what we can do is we can mimic the Cauchy formula to actually define our function of t. So that's what we're going to do. So we define f of t to be, fortunately, I didn't forget that. Uh, integral over some curve gamma, I'll tell you what gamma, something about gamma in a minute, of uh, little f of lambda of, let's say, z um, times z i minus t inverse d z. All right, just a, it looks just like a regular contour integral. Um, this is a continuous function. Oh, well, let me tell you what gamma is. So gamma has the property that the winding number of gamma about a is equal to 1 for every a in the spectrum. All right, so this is something that you can do given any compact set in the plane. A neighborhood of a compact set in the plane, you can actually find, might not just be one contour, it might be a union of contours, right? But you can find it so it's winding number by every point. Okay, and we can just define f of t um, this way. And, uh, you know, that's a perfect, that's a good definition. And it's going to be, this is a functional calculus. So f, uh, you know, f times g of t is going to be f of t times g of t. Good stuff like that, right? And so here's the, the corollary of it, which was why I gave you this first example is that if, I'm going to let you guys do this in an exercise, that if the spectrum of T is um, disconnected, uh, then he has a non trivial invariant subspace. Connected. Let's say we'll write it as a union of two disjoint compact sets. So we write 
spectrum of T is let's say uh, K1 union K2, where K1 and K2 are disjoint, and we just take F <coughs> to be 1 in a neighborhood of K1. And uh, let's say zero in a neighborhood of uh, K2. And then because, so that's uh, F squared is equal to F, right, in that neighborhood, right? So we conclude that F of T uh, squared is equal to F of T. In other words, F of T is an idempotent. And it's clear that F of T is maybe not so clear, but not too hard to show that f of t actually commutes with t. All right, so all of these, certainly the polynomials in t, they're going to commute with t. This is going to be like sort of a limit of polynomials in some sense. So f of t uh, commutes with t. And that means, in particular, that the range or the kernel of f of t uh, are invariant subspaces for t. And those are not everything, right? Because we, we have sort of a non-trivial uh, choice of spectrum. OK, so that's, you know, that's an easy result. I want to tell you something a little bit deeper, which uh, is due to uh, so I have a deeper use of analyticity, uh, which is actually, let's see. Next, uh, Yearling. The hard thing about him is, is uh, okay, so let me give you another, the quintessential example of an infinite dimensional operator is the uh, shift, op the unilateral shift. <coughs> okay, and so at first I'm going to uh, we'll use S for it. So at first I'm going to define it as a map from L2 to L2. I didn't tell you what L2 was, but you know, we can't go back to day one. And uh, it's called a shift for a reason that it shifts, right? So S, here's the closest I'm going to come to a picture, drawing pictures today, right? So it has you know, some coordinates here, and it just shifts everything one to the up. One place. Right, that's called the unilateral shift. Now it's sort of obvious that it has a lot of, um, hopefully I did it right, it has a lot of um, invariant subspaces, right? So for example, if you take all the vectors which are zero in the first coordinate, that's certainly going to be invariant. Or for that matter, the set of vectors which are zero in any finite number of coordinates, that's going to be invariant. But uh, so one job, you know, I, I forgot to say this, I forgot. Anyway, the, the game is not just, you know, I mean, the invariant subspace problem is to prove that there always are invariant subspaces. But really, I mean, practically, we don't just want to find one. We want to find a lot of them so that they'll actually give us some information about the operator itself. Like find enough of them to give us information about the operator. All right, so anyway. There's some obvious invariant subspaces here. And by the way, this has a finite dimensional analog. The finite dimensional analog is just the shift of, say, Cn. Uh, there are different notions of shift, but I'm talking about the one where it sort of falls off the end, right? So everything goes ahead one, the last one like goes to zero. So that's a shift. And for that, for that operator, uh, the only invariant subspaces are the obvious ones. They're the ones that are spanned by the first so many coordinates in your space, OK? But so you might expect that that's going to uh, you know, sort of um, persevere here. But actually, it's going to turn out not to. And that's what this guy, Deerling, sort of actually found all the, not sure, all the invariant subspaces of this operator. And, and they have a very rich structure. So I'm going to describe it right now. So the first thing is, you know, I told you that all Hilbert spaces are the same. You know, they're all unitarily equivalent. That's true. 
but sometimes it's better to look at uh, an operator in one way than in another way. And um, the way we're going to look at this is we're going to define a Hilbert space H2. And what that is, it's just the, so this is going to be contained, let's say, in the disk. Uh, it's contained in L, I guess I should say, of T. It's contained in L2 of T. And the definition of it, the easiest definition is that it's the closed linear span of all the positive powers of Z. Now, negative powers of z, all right? And the shift operator is, um, acts on here just by multiplication by z. When you multiply by z, you're moving everything one, one structure. So what's the advantage of this? The advantage of doing this is that h2 of t actually has an, you can actually put an analytic structure on the underlying space. So we can put it, so all the functions in H2 of T, so they're functions on the boundary of the disk, you can actually extend them to functions, just sort of using Cauchy's formula, you can extend them to get functions which are analytic on the interior of the disk. And they will have a nice, but you know, I mean, so what? You could have functions that are analytic on the interior, but that they somehow represent uh, the original function that you started with in the sense that if you look at the restrictions of, the, um, of your extended function to bigger and bigger circles, as r goes to 1, those functions are going to approach the original function in L2. So basically, you know, we've sort of extended arbitrary functions uh, just on, not arbitrary functions, but just the ones that are uh, here to uh, functions on, uh, you know, on, on all of the disks. Okay, now having this, uh, so we're going to use this to sort of build a bunch of invariant subspaces that we didn't, so I'm uh, going to make another def. Okay, so this is like our underlying Hilbert space, and our operator is just multiplication by z. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you how to build invariant subspaces. Let me make a few more definitions here. So first of all, h infinity of t, this by definition, it's h2 of t uh, intersect with l infinity. Sometimes I write l infinity as on the bottom. OK, so this is um, just all the bounded functions in there. And we could give. Uh, sort of a definition, so a, no, a function phi in h infinity of t is uh, inner if the um, absolute value of phi of z is equal to 1 almost everywhere for z and t. So we have such a function, right? Okay, and now here's how we can get a bunch of invariant subspaces. We can just, if we have such an inner function, we can just look at phi multiplied by uh, all of H2. subspaces that this is the most general uh, invariant subspace uh, for the shift operator. So it's a, you know, it's a fairly um, un unexpected result, at least it was when he proved it. Uh, that, so it's a very rich structure. So this H infinity has a, a very rich structure. Some functions which are in there, there are like these Mobius transformations. If you have like absolute A is less than 1, then you can take Z minus A over 1 minus A bar Z. All of you people in the complex variables know 
I love those, right? And those map the unit circle onto the unit circle. But you could take, but you can do more general than that. You can take like a finite product of these, or you can even take infinite products if you're willing to sort of scale them a little bit to make them um, converge. But there also exists a lot of other inner functions called singular inner functions that, oh, I have to say, one of my colleagues who's retired uh, a while back, I should at least have mentioned this, so these like infinite products, they have a name that was one of his favorite things to study, they're called Blaschke products, okay, in the after Blaschke. But there are other inner functions than these. And so this H infinity is a very rich space. I mean, you can do uh, the kinds of things that you do in algebra here. You can talk about um, divisibility in here. You can talk about uh, this is like a lattice. Okay, and as a lattice, it's, uh, I didn't tell you, the lattice of an operator is like the collection of all of its invariant subspaces. There are two natural lattice operations on those, right? Uh, uh, the intersection and the closure of the sum. All right, so um, then there's a natural lattice structure on these inner functions, and you know part of the theorem is that that map is um, you know actually an iso a lattice isomorphism. So you can actually use these things both ways. You can use the fact of knowing these uh, that the invariance that there's all these invariant subspaces to learn things about. Uh, inner functions, so and you can use things about inner functions to learn things about lattices of invariant subspaces. So I wanted to sort of tell you that, um, obviously going a little too slowly, which is a problem that I often have, so let's, um, okay, so I'm just going to tell you that people study a bunch of other kinds of shifts. Um, there are weighted shifts, okay, there's bilateral shifts, there's shifts of high multiplicity and stuff. Um, those are, um, you know, so people find, try to find all the invariant subspaces of them, classify them, whatever. Okay, uh, let me at least try to do one more. You're supposed to do one proof. I guess I did a proof, you know, with that sort of. Uh, but I'm going I'm to give you a proof of von Neumann's double commutant theorem to show you that invariant subspaces are sort of useful. Uh, so here's, let's let A, suppose A is an algebra something other. I'm going to prove it in five dimensions, but then we'll talk about how it generalizes. So it's a subalgebra. operations, 
So you can look at all of the subspaces which are invariant under all the operators in A, and then you can go and look at all of the operators that leave all of those invariant subspaces invariant. So an obvious thing, you know, we obviously have that A is contained in Al's lab A. Right? Uh, and uh, also, similarly, it's obvious that A is contained in its second commentant. So what we're claiming is that in fact they're they're equal. Alright, so we're going to prove this. There's many ways to prove it, but I'm going to sort of show you a nice trick of von Neumann so you will at least have learned something today. Um, so what we're going to do is, so let x be in Cn. And then I'm going to look at um, Ax. So what does that mean? That means apply all the operators in A, in the algebra A, to the vector x. What intelligent thing can you say about that? So, well, okay, that might be true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this invariant under A. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Now next is invariant under A. Um, and uh, I'm just the M is invariant under A. But A is self-adjoint. So since A is self-adjoint, it means that every subspace invariant under A, its orthogonal complement is also invariant under A. And that's the same thing as saying that projection onto that space actually commutes with A. So we can conclude that, uh, therefore, projection onto M is in A prime. But now, even though um, A double prime might be bigger than A, A triple prime is always the same as A prime. Would you write A prime yeah. or A double prime right there? Here? All right. You're not even supposed to be able to do that. So this is in A prime, so a fortiori, to show you, you know, uh, therefore, it's, a, it's also in A triple prime, right? Which means that in fact, PM, I'm not going to write that down, PM commutes with A double prime, but that means that the range of PM is actually invariant under A double prime. I'm saying, so this is a projection and it commutes, whenever you have a projection that commutes with something, its range is invariant under whatever it commutes with. Okay, so that, so therefore the range of PM, which is M, is invariant. So there, in other words, therefore AX is actually invariant under A double prime. Right? And what that means is that A double prime of x is the same as ax. I mean, we obviously had one inclusion, but now we have the other uh, inclusion as well. So the way to say this is what we've just shown here is that locally a double prime acts the same way as a. If we just look at one vector at a time, uh, we can get, uh, you give me anything in a, I can find something, uh, give me anything in a double prime, I can find something that acts the same way as it on that uh, one vector. Of course, a priori, it might be that for different x's, I would have to use different things in A here, right? OK, but now we use this von Neumann trick. And I'll use like tensor product notation for those of you who are the agnosti or whatever the word is for it. And so he has a very, and this plays a big role in um, you know, in operator theory in general, is we're going to look at like um, A tends to product with uh, two by two identity matrices. So for those of you who want to really, you know, think about it concretely, it's just a set of all things of the form AA, uh, where A belongs to A. 
just a two-fold copy, that's what we call it, of that. Um, all right, well, so actually that's what it's called. Well, it's very easy to compute the commutant of that. Um, so the, com the commutant, well, I don't want to, we're sort of running out of time here. So the point is that, yeah, okay, well, what's the commutant going to be? It's going to be all two two by two matrices with arbitrary entries, but all the entries come from A prime, right? And so when we do the second commutant, well, that's going to be the set of all things that commute with those, and that's going to be just all two by two entries uh, with entries from A double prime. That makes sense, or maybe let me just write a little bit down. So A two prime actually turns out to be A prime tensor the two by two matrices, okay, which is what I said, it's all two by two matrices whose entries come from A prime, and then when we do the second commutant of that, um, this is just going to be the second commutant of A uh, tensor prime, and so in other words, it's a two-fold copy of A2 of A. But now, if A was self-adjoint, A2 is self-adjoint just as well, right? And so what we learned here is going to be true even for um, A2, and inductively it's going to be true for any uh, N, right? So we're actually going to have, from applying this in general, that uh, A, uh, let's say, double prime n-fold copy of it, uh, on any vector, so this vector here will have like n coordinates, right? Because these are acting right on an n fold copy of the space. That will be the same as doing A itself n fold copy on X, right? But X is like the, you know, so what is this? This is like having you know, anything, this is like having a string of n little a's together. And now this vector here, they don't have to have the same uh, coordinates, right? So what this is saying, and this is, you know, really a uh, sort of brilliant observation, is that therefore we can, you know, when we said this, we, it meant that we can only control, we can make the things in A double prime act one vector at a time is the way that A does. But now we can make it work for any n, right? You give me a vector x, uh, you give me n vectors in the underlying Hilbert space, and anything in A double prime, I can find something in A that does exactly the same thing to all of those vectors. Well, if we're in finite dimensions, then that's enough to show that we actually have the operator that we started with choose a basis for the space. So that's um, my women's double time theorem. I better do uh, some other things. There's another way to prove this theorem, sort of using the spectral theorem. Um, but I guess we're not going to do that now. But I want to show you, you know, I mean, this is sort of one of the applications, if you want to <coughs> in some cases. The, you know, the spectral theorem is a fairly you know, not terribly difficult, but it's a fairly intensive uh, piece of work, right? Whereas this was really, okay, you have to know about ampliations, but really there's no, you know, nothing sort of hard about this. Okay, let me, you know, try to give you uh, just a little bit of uh, feeling, some results and stuff, and um, okay, so what do you do when you can't, you know, when you have an open problem, you try to make up special cases of it. Well, there's several things that you're going to do. You try to make up harder problems, right, until you finally find something that's false. Or you can try to prove special cases of it, right? And so let me give you a little bit of that industry, sort of. Uh, so we can sort of uh, talk about um, the trans. OK, so one thing that we can do is, so we started out with the invariant self-space problem. I'm going to sort of list some uh, harder and harder problems. So then the next thing is what's called the transitive algebra problem. Well, let's do this. The, um, the uh, hyperinvariant subspace problem. So 
word hyperinvariance is used in different ways in operator theory, but here it just means a subspace that's not just invariant under the operator, but also simultaneously invariant under all operators that commute with it. Of course, there's a certain operator which will not have any hyperinvariant subspaces, scalar multiple of the identity, because the commutant of those, that is everything, right? And there's no subspace other than the trivial ones that's simultaneously invariant under all operators. But so the hyperinvariant subspace problem asks whether every operator that's not a scalar multiple of the identity necessarily um, has a non-trivial hyperinvariant subspace. Okay, the next sort of level is what's called a transitive algebra problem. Okay, and what that, so an algebra is transitive if it has no non-trivial invariant subspaces. Of course, there are some algebras like that. So the question asks whether every transitive um, algebra, so the question is, um, is basically P of H, I didn't have a chance to tell you about all the good topologies. Well, can't do everything. Uh, is B of H the only weakly closed? tell you what weekly means, okay, uh, closed um, operator algebra. Oh, weekly closed operator transitive. to the invariant subspace problem, because you could just start with one operator and look at the algebra that it generates, right? Then, because of this, it wouldn't be transitive, so it couldn't have, so it would have to have non-trivial invariant subspaces. And I'm just going to mention you know, one more level of this, which is called the reductive algebra problem. So one of the things, um, you know, that these, these are called our Norman algebras, by the way, algebras which are closed in the topology and they're equal to their sets of commutons. Well, actually, that's the same thing. Um, and they're self adjoint. So they always, their lattices are always complemented, right? Every subspace which is invariant under a von Neumann algebra, its orthogonal complement is also invariant under the von Neumann algebra. So such an algebra is called reductive if every subs invariant subspace is, in fact, um, reducing for the space. So the final uh, problem in this sort of sequence here is, uh, is every reductive uh, operator algebra necessarily self
So what you sort of have to say is you have to say, if you have a finite rank operator whose central support is the whole space, uh, then does that mean that the algebra has to be um, that has to be has to be a self joint. Okay, so anyway, you know we can play this game, and so let me tell you a couple uh, times that you know where we know. So the one game, you know, I should at least mention something that I had something to do with. So one place where you know all this stuff has been generated, generalized from finite rank operators to compact operators. So the definition just is a finite rank uh, compact operator. just means uh, norm limit of a sequence of finite rank operators. All right, um, now just to give you a little feeling for what this is, you, the e, one of the easiest classes of operators to look at are the ones that are diagonalizable. So, you know, the ones that are infinite, like diagonal matrices. The ones of those that are compact are the ones for which the diagonal entries go to zero. So this is a much richer class than just the finite rank operators. And, uh, another minute, I may Huh? You, you only have... Okay. Well, let me have. I know you're just keep the talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, keep the mind in a minute. Okay. So let me just tell you the uh, yeah. That's right. So the, thing <laughs> is, the game. This is really. So this is a little like motivation for graduate students. Okay. So the first thing that. So it's been known for a long time that. Uh, I mean. So the first proof that all compact operators have non-trivial invariant subspaces was a very complicated proof. It actually used non-standard analysis. And then it was translated, you know, to, and then people like tried to generalize it. So they tried to generalize that to like what's called a polynomially compact operator. So the operator itself might not be compact, but some polynomial would be. And they're sort of inching along, right? And it's sort of like what people were sort of hoping, that, that, but they never thought that they could do it, was prove that every compact operator at least has a hyperinvariant subspace. And it was a graduate student who did it. And he did it like totally different, you know, the, all the experts, you know, were sort of working with all these complicated things and stuff, and he just used a fixed point theorem, you know, to prove that theorem. And then, of course, everybody gets on the bandwagon, so you know that they have a hyperinvariant subspace, and then you prove that every transitive algebra that has a hyperinvariant subspace. Okay, just one more thing I'll say is I should at least give you one negative result. So um, there, at first, you know, there there was a very complicated construction by uh, an English mathematician by the name of Reed of a uh, an operator on a Banach space a very wild bionic space that doesn't have any trivial invariant subspaces, non-trivial invariant subspaces. And that relatively recently has been sort of jacked up to actually get an operator on uh, little L1 that doesn't have any non-trivial. OK, well, sorry, I could keep you for another couple hours or something. <laughs>
when you talk about the, uh, the purity serum, is the most general invariance space, what that means? That means that every invariant subspace takes that form. Uh, every closed invariant subspace for the shift, that, that by the way is a game that, you know, people, you know, it's not, you know, we only want to find one invariant subspace because we can't even find that, right? But our real goal would be to find all of them if we could. Right? In most cases, we have no hope of it, right? And so, you know, he found for the shift operator, he did find all of them. And, you know, and all of them is a pretty rich structure, right? Yeah, so that's what most general means that those are all the ones there are. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Eddie again.